Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are live. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's lesson in XR design, how to create a great tabletop RPG in XR, brought to you by CircuitStream. Today, we're going to be learning the best approach to transitioning a tabletop RPG into an XR environment. I'm your host, Brendan, and shortly we'll be joined by your instructor for today, Alita Singleton. Before we get into it, I wanted to do a quick audio video check. Let me know in the comments if you can hear me and see me. It would be greatly appreciated. And I will just give that a moment. Thumbs up. Yes, hear, see, good. Can hear you. Perfect. OK. Awesome. I appreciate the uh, the feedback there. Also wanted to provide a quick overview of your layout here. So to the uh, it's going to be the top right of your interactions tab. You'll notice a little bell icon. If any of the sounds or notifications are distracting or annoying to you, go ahead and hit that bell icon. It will silence all of them. Uh, with regards to any comments that you have through the, uh, the workshop today, go ahead and engage with other audience members. We also have a few team members in the audience uh, who would love to hear from you. Uh, throughout the workshop, if you have questions, uh, definitely I would ask that you direct those to the questions tab. That's to do the bottom right of your interactions tab. Uh, we are going to do a Q&A at the end of the session today, and we want to make sure that we're well organized and we can address any questions that you, uh, that you bring up throughout the presentation. Uh, lastly, we have uh, a few polls that I want to uh, put in the, the, the polls tab. Uh, again, that's going to be to the bottom right. And this is just to kind of gauge uh, the experience of the audience as well as just you know, gather some feedback. We want to make sure that we're, we're providing some, uh, some valuable topics to, uh, to everyone joining us. So uh, definitely important to, to you know, know more about that. The first, uh, the first poll I'm going to post actually is going to just be, uh, what industry are you interested in? You know, whether that is um, applying, you know, tools like Unity to, or you know, getting more involved in the uh, AR VR development or design in that field. Um, just curious to know what kind of industry you are focusing on. Okay, so I've just added that uh, that poll, and um, we'll wait just a moment. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. So um, who am I? My name is Brendan. I am on the partnerships team here at CircuitStream in the higher education department. Uh, I come from a background actually of finance and investment management more specifically. Um, and just a fun fact about me, I am a competitive rugby player who has never broken a bone in their body. And I feel like that is uh, very, very lucky uh, on my end. Uh, your instructor for today uh, is going to be Aletha Singleton. So she is a UX instructor and curriculum advisory board member here at CircuitStream. Uh, she comes from a background of over 22 years of design experience. And this will be across multiple platforms and educational uh, UX designer for extended reality. She is an ordained elder pastor at a VR MMO church. I feel like that might be uh, the first of her kind. Uh, and aside from that, she has custom built all her own furniture relative to her height at 4'10". Uh, so very impressive. Uh, many, many skills uh, that Aletha brings to the table. Uh, now, what's going to be our agenda for today? So uh, the first 10 to 15 minutes, I just want to do a bit more of an introduction for CircuitStream, just to kind of shed light on, on who we are, where we come from. Then we'll get into the technical session. That will be about 45 to 60 minutes, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on um, you know, if there are any kind of speed bumps along the way. Then we'll do a wrap up and I'll share additional resources that CircuitStream, you know, offers. It should take about 10, again, 10 to 15 minutes. And then lastly, we'll do the live Q&A. So we definitely want to circle back on any questions that you've had throughout the workshop. Uh, and we want to make sure to address any of those in detail. Just for anyone watching, uh, anyone watching live, I definitely recommend sitting back, getting cozy and focusing on just digesting the information that Aletha is going to be sharing with you. Take notes, actively listen, uh, comment, and ask questions. When you're ready to start implementing what we're learning today, leverage the replay. Everyone here is going to receive the replay for this workshop shortly after we conclude. Uh, and just a reminder for anyone who is abroad, if you do have to take, um, you know, take off early, this is going to be recorded. So don't worry. We'll, we'll make sure that you get the, uh, the, the recording afterwards. So who or what is CircuitStream? So we were formed in 2015 when we identified a demand for education in the growing XR industry. 
Our focus is on, on providing the highest quality education in XR design and development, as well as for industry leading tools such as Unity. To date, we've helped over 45,000 learners develop their technical skills around immersive and emerging tech. Now, we have team members and instructors all over the world who are passionate about accelerating the AR and VR industry. This also helps us accommodate students across different time zones and geographies. Uh, we've worked with some of the largest organizations in the world, such as Walmart, Lockheed Martin, the U.S. Navy, and many others. I'm sure some of the names on, uh, on this slide here will be uh, familiar to you. But we work with organizations large and small, right down to the individual learners. Now, how do we do this? We do this through our academic offerings. So CircuitStream offers flagship courses in programming. Uh, around programming, XR development and design, as well as for Unity's development or physics engine. Uh, first of all, on the left there, you'll notice the XR development with Unity course. Um, so that's 10 weeks in duration. It consists of three hours a week of live instructor-led sessions. It's a beginner-friendly course for any students or professionals who are interested in adding the fundamentals of XR development to their skill set. Uh, the next cohort will launch on July 26th. Uh, next to that is the XR Interaction Design and Prototyping course. Again, 10 weeks, beginner friendly, and has three hours a week of live instruction. So very similar in structure. Uh, this, however, is for artists and designers who want to focus uh, more on immersion, environmental elements, and user experience. Students will in the process of prototyping for AR and VR. Uh, and this is very popular among UI UX designers, as well as product designers looking to upskill for emerging spatial computing platforms. The next cohort for the Interaction Design and Prototyping course will be launching on July 13th. Uh, either of these XR-focused courses are project-driven and have been designed to help students break into exciting professions related to augmented virtual and or mixed reality. Uh, and then the third one here, the Unity Developer Bootcamp, that's our newest and most elaborate course yet. It revolves around launching your career as a real-time 3D developer, employing Unity as your main tool for creation. The 24-week Unity Developer Bootcamp is a career course that offers more than five hours of live instruction throughout the week with an additional five hours of hands-on learning in labs over the weekend. You'll learn how to code in C-sharp, manage a multitude of programs and resources integrated with Unity, uh, and professionally manage Unity projects. There will also be a multitude of resources and career services students can access to help launch their careers in real-time 3D development. The next cohort for the Unity Developer Bootcamp will be launching on October 11th. We'll be doing XR Interaction Design. Awesome. We are looking forward to having you, Raul. Uh, you can also leverage the expertise of our instructors for anything Unity and XR related with our one-on-one -on -one project support and mentorship packages. These sessions have tons of flexibility regarding how you use them. Um, it can be leveraged for additional course learning, for troubleshooting and project support, or for learning about topics within XR that may not be captured in any of our flagship curriculums. Uh, for example, Unreal Engine. I'm also proud to announce that we have, you know, began partnering with some of the most well-recognized universities to offer our courses through their continued education and micro-credential programs. This is helping all kinds of students access our unique set of XR design and development courses through well-established educational institutions. Now, you've heard me mention Unity a couple of times at this point, uh, and I'm going to add another poll into the polls tab here just very quickly. And that is how much Unity experience do you have on a scale of 0 to 10? Uh, so 0 being uh, zero being no experience whatsoever, and 10 being that you are the Yoda of Unity, and uh, basically it's an extension of your, uh, of your living being. Uh, so I posted that tab, and actually I did not post the uh, the previous tab, so I'm going to do that one as well. And uh, and I'd much uh, very much appreciate if you answered the what industry are you interested in as well. Uh, so go onto your your polls tab. Uh, sorry that I, I missed that one there, but uh, um, and your feedback uh, is much appreciated there. Um, now, what is Unity? If you're familiar with this interface, then you probably already know what Unity is capable of. For anyone not familiar. Uh, for anyone not familiar, it is a tool that is completely free to use and is one of the most robust and dynamic development engines on the market. It is also the easiest way to start creating applications, games, and even productions and experiences, as in film and television. 
how exactly does Unity work? It starts with your idea. You would build your idea out using Unity, and from there, you can apply one or multiple SDKs to then publish or launch your idea on a multitude of platforms. Just a couple quick steps by the looks of things, am I right? Not exactly. Well, it isn't It isn't so straightforward, but uh, here at CircuitStream, our instructors are great at teaching you every step in detail throughout this process, from creating your idea from scratch to troubleshooting and launching your finished product and everything in between. Currently, Unity is also responsible for approximately 60% of the content that has been produced for AR and VR marketplaces today. Lastly, I want to mention that CircuitStream is a Unity channel partner and authorized training provider, and our Unity certified instructors have a combined decades of experience in Unity and XR design and development. They also maintain the highest level of certification available directly through Unity. Now, today is a lesson in XR design, how to create a great tabletop RPG in XR. Uh, so what you're going to be learning about today are how to research uh, is how to research like a designer, how to conduct a competitive investigation, how to ideate, plan, and prototype based on research, and how to use the research for transitioning a project into immersive environments. Uh, so just a few more notes before, uh, before we get this show on the road. Uh, before Aletha takes over, again, this part is going to be about 45 to 60 minutes. This will be recorded and sent to you. Um, should already have received any project files that that may be necessary uh, otherwise please let us know and we can we can get uh, any of those to you questions should be uh, directed to the questions tab we will we will do the q a at the end uh, and this is just going to help us organize and make sure that we're able to address all your questions uh, aside from that sit back relax soak up all this great information that alitha is going to be sharing with us uh, and enjoy the workshop um, so at this point, I will bring on Aletha to the stage. Uh, Aletha, are you there? Perfect. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. I can see you. Uh, how is our audience uh, feeling? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Okay, wonderful. I will jump off stage, Aletha, and let you, uh, let you get to it. Okay. Um, just getting the screen share set up here. And... Give me a moment. OK. And is everyone able to see the slide deck? You'll have to tell me verbally, Brendan. You are good. OK, good, because I can't see it because I've got the slides up. Yeah. So like, um, like Brendan said, my name is Aletha Singleton. I'm an immersive tech UX design professional with over, I just did the math. I'm kind of sad because it's showing my age. Over 24 years of experience designing across multiple technologies, including more recently extended reality. And I'm also a UX design instructor and curriculum advisor here at CircuitStream. And for the past few years, I've been working towards pushing the forward the UX, UX as a profession in the XR technology landscape. And as a big part of that, I created a website called the UX for XR Toolkit, where I write about my learnings transitioning into the space from traditional 2D design. And I share the best practices that I use when designing immersive experiences through videos and articles. And I'm also actively working to build up a design pattern library of how others have solved XR design problems in the past. And all of this is in the hopes of helping others who want to transition into the space, not only by teaching you foundational best practices and giving examples, but also by helping you get practical project experience. And I'm still working on that part. But besides learning the foundational UX best practices for XR, one of the most important things that you're going to have to start doing now if you want to transition into this space is to start playing video games and trying out as many XR experiences as you can get your hands on. And yes, that means you have permission to start gaming for your career advancement. Game development has a heavy influence on VR development in particular. So understanding how the NPC models behave in certain situations and what interactions are easier or hard to figure out, game mechanics, much more, will give you a greater understanding of how to design quality immersive experiences. So back in January of this year, I started a live Twitch stream where I play video games and VR experiences and talk through them from a UX designer's perspective. 
And during each stream, I analyze the experience using the pillars of gaming UX as outlined by Celia Hoden in her book, The Gamer's Brain. And then at the end of each session, I do a rose thorn bud analysis on each experience and talk about what best practices to keep in mind if you were to translate it into XR. And the overall UX design process is to conduct research on the target audience, design a potential solution or solutions, prototype those solutions just enough to click through key scenarios and test them with the target audience. And you iterate on the design based on those findings and you build something to launch. And this is ideally a cyclical approach that continues throughout your project lifecycle, not just a one and done research. So usually with interaction design, in addition to the upfront user research, you would also do what's called competitive landscape research, where you see how others have solved the problems that you're now trying to solve. And you would look at what works and what doesn't work and think through any gaps and what you could design to make things better for your own solution. And the stream focuses on this step of competitive landscape research. So the whole idea with a stream is to give you practical experience in design analysis and critical thinking through live participation in the chat or through asynchronous comments on the videos on YouTube. And I do check them and respond to them. And you can follow my Twitch channel to get announcements when I go live and I'll share all the links at the end if they haven't already been, there's a PDF. So I've been grouping the games that I play by genre the first of which was tabletop RPGs. And if this were a real project, I would take these learnings to help determine what to keep in mind if I were creating my own tabletop RPG. And I've now finished that genre and I'm going to now share these findings from that research. So you're now gonna be sitting in what you would see as a professional research, uh, a designed research report out. So you're getting experience absorbing research now. So these are the games that I studied. Voice of Cards, The Owl Dragon Roars, the demo on Steam Desktop. Shadowverse on Steam Desktop. Card Hunter on Steam Desktop. Demio with Steam VR with the Vive Cosmos headset. And Cards and Tankards with Steam VR and the Vive Cosmos headset. And you can watch all of these videos on demand on my YouTube channel. And here are some of the things that all of the games do successfully to create a great experience. The sound, lighting, and visuals can make or break an immersive experience. So all aspects of the virtual environment should support the story. All of these games should use sound effects. All of these use sound effects, music, and lighting effectively to create mood. And research shows that using a multimodal approach to education that engages all the senses is the most effective way to increase retention. And this includes onboarding people into your digital experiences. And all of these games have implemented tutorials that allow you to learn by doing. And it's important to take into account the learning curve or the level of the challenge and the pacing for increasing that level of challenge as you progress in the game. And all of these games have implemented a flow that starts with the basic interactions and introduces more advanced ones over time. Signs and feedback help people know what they can interact with and whether or not they were successful in doing so. And all of these games use clear signs and feedback to signify successful or unsuccessful interactions. And using existing mental models for your game genre will make it easier for people to learn and understand the mechanics of your game. And all of these games use card designs that follow existing mental models for tabletop RPGs. Each of the games have standout features or behaviors that go the extra mile to create an even better experience for people. Card Hunters, free to play business model doesn't constantly throw the real money options in your face. And it's a very clear model with no guessing or gotcha schemes. And there are so, also aren't any annoying or disruptive pop-ups every few minutes to, that are trying to get you to spend real money. And that's a very frustrating trend in many free-to-play models. And that often results in a very prompt uninstall of the game. I only came across the real money options when I was trying to figure out the in-game pizza currency model, because I noticed the little pizza icons and that melty cheese design caught my interest and I wanted to know more about it. It also made me want pizza in real life. But one of the problems with physical cards in real life is that they're by nature static. 
and when you stack and fan the cards to hold them, you're not able to see the most important information, which is the card stats, since it's usually on the bottom or in the middle of the card. And this means that players usually have to sift through the cards and read them to decide which one to play. So Shatterverse keeps the mental model of the card designs when you're looking at the information. However, they also take full advantage of that digital space and adjust the card design dynamically so that you can still see the stats when the cards are fanned out in your hand. And all of these games have a single player mode where you can play an AI to practice. And one of the common problems across games with this mode of play is that you don't always know what's going on when you're waiting for the AI's turn to complete. And you're, that means that you're not sure that there's whether there's some kind of technical issue or if you're supposed to be doing something instead or if they're in the process of doing something during their turn of play. Shadowverse solves this problem by showing a notification that the AI is thinking when there's no visible activity happening during their turn. And Voice of Cards has a similar solution to Shadowverse for playing their mini game with an NPC, which is a non-player character. All of the NPC's moves are shown to keep you informed of what's happening, as opposed to guessing and wondering if the game's stalled. And it also has a message saying it's waiting. And although everyone in the tabletop RPG genre loves their minis, in real life, they just sit there unmoving until you move them. And then they just sit there again. Both of the VR games, Demio and Cards and Tankards, take advantage of the digital world again by bringing their minis to life with animations that activate when you move them, acting out the action that you're playing. And now let's go through the overarching issues that I found across all the games. The information architecture of the menus and the in-game inventory management are not always as intuitive or clear as they could be, resulting in confusion over where to go to complete certain tasks. So in this example, collection, owned, cards, and setup all have the exact same submenu items, but completely different tasks under each. And a good information architecture is vital to helping people find content and accomplish tasks. So I was constantly having to switch between them to figure out where I needed to go to equip items versus just review stuff and so forth. And it was pretty frustrating. So the lack of ability to manually progress the dialogue during tutorials and cutscenes makes you miss important information because you're still trying to process what was previously said while the tutorial and the narration continue to bowl forward. And this results in information overload and a lack of confidence and understanding of what's being learned. And this is especially an issue when you're learning mechanics and rules of game genre that you've never played before. And it's completely preventable by allowing people the option to just manually progress the dialogue at their own pace. And there seems to be this general assumption that players are already familiar with the tabletop RPG genre. And this makes the onboarding process much more of a cognitive load for those that are brand new to this type of gaming. So many people find free demos of digital tabletop RPGs to be a great introduction to the genre since physical cards and minis and so forth can be very costly and can take up a lot of space. So being able to try the genre out digitally is a great way to see if they want to invest more time and money. So don't forget this very important demographic when you're designing your experiences. In this example, I was playing with a Sony PS4 controller. That's all I have. The assumption for game makers seems to be that anyone with a PC is going to have an Xbox controller. And this is a wrong assumption. The lack of support for multiple controller types on the PC-based games and the PC-based VR experiences adds a level of cognitive load since the player has to mentally translate the tooltips while they're playing. And this often results in accidental interactions that can lead to frustration. Lack of support for multiple controller types in VR could cause serious usability issues depending on the button configurations. And this is a common problem with PC-based VR experiences that have set up support for Vive Pro headsets and not Vive Cosmos. And I have a Vive Cosmos. And when someone wearing a Cosmos headset loads the game, it's often detected as a Vive Pro and will activate the wand controllers instead of the Cosmos controllers, making it difficult or sometimes even impossible to interact with the virtual world. And some games don't recognize the controllers at all, which means that you can't interact with anything. Failure to translate regional control mental models from Japan to the Americas results in additional level of cognitive load, since the player has to consciously fight 
against instilled muscle memory of which buttons do what on the controllers. And each of the following games have standout issues or behaviors that we want to think about and try to avoid in our own experiences. Card Hunter has a seemingly inconsistent interaction of selecting targets during play. Some targets are selected before the card enlarges. That's the card enlarging indicates that you've committed that action, while other actions have you select targets after you commit the action. And one of the inconsistencies in targeting interactions is a result of auto-targeting feature that is activated by default in the game settings. And this then contributes to further confusion and increases the potential to accidentally target an enemy contrary to the one that they are desiring to target. With Card Hunter, it's not clear when exiting whether or not the game has saved or will autosave. This makes me worried that I'm going to lose two hours of gameplay progress when I'm exiting. And after closing the game, I did do a double check to see if my game was saved and it does in fact autosave. It's just not apparent that it's doing that. In Demio, you have to look down to see the tabletop setup of the maps and the minis, just like you would in the real world. But combining this extended look down behavior with the weight of the VR headset, it quickly causes neck strain and pain. And Demio uses the drag world variant where you use both controllers to grab the environment and drag it around. And this increases the risk of motion sickness if there are no mitigations in place to adjust for the comfort needs. Cards and Tankards has a variety of interaction methods, including touch for nearby UI panels and a raycast or a laser for objects or panels that are further away. However, both remain active at the same time, resulting in the raycast competing with the touch or the grip interactions, thus risking accidental interactions. And in this example, I ended up rage quitting before I could finish customizing my avatar because I kept accidentally clicking the wrong thing. And the card discard pile, is an important element needed for gameplay in tabletop RPG games, but Cards and Tankards has placed the discard pile well outside of the comfortable reach on the table, also outside of your field of view. It's pretty far down the table. So it's outside of your field of view of the headset and outside of comfortable reach. However, the health and the mana icons, which don't require my frequent interaction, are directly in front of me within easy reach. My opponent seems to need to interact with those elements more than I do. Cards and Tankards, like many tabletop RPG games, gives you the option of either attacking the cards that your opponent has placed on the table or directly attacking your opponent. However, the placement and the spacing of the target area or the heart of your opponent is too close in proximity to the target areas for the cards on the table. Sometimes the cards on the table occlude the target area for the opponent. And this interferes with the gameplay and it risks accidental selection of the wrong target. And they have also placed the majority of their UI manual panels within a watch style interface that requires you to hold up your arm for extended periods of time. And this results in neck strain and arm fatigue. And they place large amounts of text into their UI panels and use font treatments that don't accommodate the lower resolutions of the VR headsets. The lower resolution of the headsets creates a screen door effect that will cause line vibration and eye strain when you're using smaller fonts or thinner font weights. And their tutorial UI panels are placed at eye level and stick to the viewport causing frustration when you try to move your head to look around the environment. And because the panels follow you where you're looking, they obscure your view of the world. And they're also placed in close proximity, which results in eye strain due to the lower resolution of the headsets. And to be fair, cards and tankards, they are early access. So hopefully a lot of these issues will be addressed in a future release, a full release. So based on all of these findings, this is what we can take away as a general recommendations for tabletop RPG genre. So as with any type of software development project, it's important to remember that we are not our target audience. We are more heavily experienced in XR, whereas the people in the target groups are mostly not going to be power users and are by majority new to XR experiences. Interaction elements that we take for granted are going to be a high impact for most target audiences. So unlike us, they will be dealing with a high level of information overload. And there's an awe factor that takes up much of a person's focus. So in addition to the awe factor, they're also expected to digest the information that you're communicating to them within the experience. 
So we always need to keep this in mind when we're designing any XR application. Since we're dealing with this off factor and the potential of information overload, we need to make sure that we're designing the experience in such a way that people have control over the progression of the story and the content since they need the extra time to digest everything that they're seeing and experiencing. Start with a default setting of manual progression of the content in the tutorials and then give them the option to change to an auto progression if they want to go faster. And motion sickness is one of the most common negative side effects of VR experiences, and this can include a feeling of seasickness, headaches, general nausea, dizziness, vertigo, or even in some cases, vomiting. And this happens when there's a mismatch between what's being seen and what's being felt, or in other words, your eyes see that you're moving, but your body doesn't feel any motion. And it's very important to take this very seriously and ensure that the experiences that we create have precautions in place to reduce the possibility or the risk of sickness. So locomotion is the way that people move around within virtual worlds. And in order to get the best experience and to reduce the risk of motion sickness or fatigue, it's important to understand the different types of locomotion, their pros and cons, best practices, and when best to use them. And it's also a good practice to offer multiple types of locomotion in order to allow more people who have different levels of susceptibility to motion sickness to enjoy your experience. And be sure to add mitigations for sickness and flexibility of comfort options for players to have the best experience. For example, in the case of Demio's use of drag world type of locomotion, they've chosen this method due to the need to move around and peer around the objects to get better views of the game table maps. So if we were prioritizing improvements on an existing product, I would recommend that you start by adding motion sickness comfort options to mitigate the risk of sickness with this type of locomotion. And for future iteration, I would recommend exploring other ways to move around or to see the table sections. Think about tabletop RPG games with 3D maps in real life. This is an example of a real one. The scale of the maps and the walls in relation to the player minis are such that the players can see the characters from almost any angle. So as the maps become more intricate, explore ways to allow players who are more susceptible to sickness to still be able to see the minis without forcing them to have to move around the environment. Take advantage of this technology and see what you can come up with because we can do a lot more with this than we can in real life. So when designing UI elements and interfaces within the virtual environment, real world physical ergonomics should be taken into consideration. Be sure to keep head rotations within comfortable ranges, especially when you're using gaze targeting or for longer durations or for repetitive tasks. Text to neck is a result of extended look down interactions. And this can this has only recently become a widespread issue since the invention of the smartphone. The longer someone holds up a phone to interact with it, you'll notice the arm begins to lower and the neck begins to bend down. And this can cause a lot of pain and stress on the neck from being bent for long periods of time. The lower the neck bends, the more pressure is put on the neck. And this medical condition is called smartphone neck or text neck. If you add on the weight of a heads up display, this increases the amount of pressure on the neck even more. So be sure to keep this in mind when you're designing your tabletop experiences and explore new ways to design the tabletop layout to prevent physical strain while still staying true to the tabletop genre. So spending time in a virtual environment can be physically tiring for people who aren't used to it. A typical tabletop RPG session, such as Dungeons and Dragons, can last up to four hours. So be sure to consider the length of time that people will spend in the headset and design the environment and the interactions with physical ergonomics in mind. Back in 2002, when Minority for Report first came out, rumors abounded that Tom Cruise had to take frequent breaks on set when he's filming the scenes with the pre-crime scrubber. And although he was in great shape, his arms were getting tired from holding them up for so long when interacting with the vertical gestural interface. And when designing vertical interfaces, it's best to keep people from having to keep their arms raised for long periods of time. Otherwise, their arms will become fatigued and will start to hurt. The longer they keep their arms in the air, the heavier they become. And in the tech world, this is known as gorilla arm. The watch or the wrist interface is becoming a popular design for diegetic menus in virtual space. And there's nothing wrong with this. It is a great solution. However, ergonomics and fatigue still need to be taken into account when you're designing wrist interfaces. Cards and tankards and Demio both use a wrist interface 
in their experiences. However, there are distinct differences in design that make Demio a more successful execution as far as ergonomics and fatigue are concerned. Cards and tankards places about almost everything in their wrist menu, which causes both eye strain and physical fatigue. Demio only uses wrist interfaces for quick access items during game, gameplay, such as their initial character selection and the turn tracker and the playing cards. All of their other UI panels are placed on panels in 3D space. It's not it's best not to use a wrist interface for extended interactions. Think about what should go in a wrist interface versus what should have a different type of panel treatment. And remember to keep in mind that the real physical environment still impacts the experience that you're creating within the headset. Immediately throwing someone into an experience as soon as they, as they launch the app could result in them missing important content. And that's because they may still need to make adjustments to the headset or the controllers. And this actually happened with Demio when it they started some narration as soon as you launch the app and I have still to this day have no idea what they said because I was still always setting up my headset when that happens. So giving them control over when to start and stop the experience as opposed to starting the main content immediately on launch will allow them to take the time to make any adjustments and acclimate to the new world before jumping into the main goals of the experience. And this is also another reason it's best practice to let people manually progress the content as opposed to auto-progressing it for them because external things to the headset happen. And in order to avoid eye strain and headaches, headaches, it's important to pay attention to the placement of the text elements in virtual 3D space. For font size, depth, contrast, spacing, density, lighting, and many other things can affect the legibility of text and UI elements. So try to keep the text at an optimal viewing distance of two to three meters from the viewer. And traditional font sizes that are used in 2D screen UI elements generally are around 12 to 32 points. They are pretty small in AR and VR environments when they're placed two to three meters away. So the distance, the size of the font is going to vary depending on how close or far away the UI panel is from you. So you would follow posters and signage design examples. So also since the resolution of the current devices is so low, you end up with this screen door effect, which makes finer details such as the text and the scratches on materials much harder to see, especially at smaller sizes. And that means that we need to take design best practices from print and poster signage, like I said, as guidance for font sizes and for the finer details in the virtual environments. So try to use regular bold sans serif fonts where possible and keep them to two font families. And avoid italics since they make the text harder to read, especially in VR. And in order to help people scan your content quickly, you need to have a good visual hierarchy in place. And less is more. The more text and content you put in your design, the harder it will be to scan and read. So keep your text short and simple. And avoid sticking text elements or anything to the HUD. Besides being too close to the viewer, it's annoying and it can make you want to swat it away like you would a fly. And for people who wear progressives or bifocals, depending on where the content's placed in relation to the location of the progressive or the bifocal portions of the eyeglass lenses, the digital content may not be visible or legible at all. And so explore alternative panel placements. Don't just stick things to the hood. So when providing the guidance and instruction for the content being covered, it's important to make sure that the players know the goal and understand how to accomplish it within the virtual environment. Give them clear calls to action throughout the experience, but especially when you're teaching them how to use the controllers and interact with the environment or the objects in the world, uh, like interactions or onboarding tutorials. And give them a clear goal to focus on and complete. And restricting their choices to explore during onboarding, especially, or if you're doing training, will uh, reduce their distractions and help them to maintain focus. And give them control over when to move on to the next task goal or location. And provide clear wayfinding to the next task goal or location. So during tutorials, have the player move in a linear path. Provide the goal. Enable them to complete the goal successfully. Upon successful completion, give them the options to proceed to the next goal or try again. And repeat from step one if that's applicable. 
For tabletop RPGs, think about how onboarding can be simplified even more for people brand new to the genre. You'll need to research this demographic to better to get better insights, which will require UX strategy. And also consider providing different levels of tutorials and gameplay for those that are completely new to the genre versus those that are more familiar with it and just want to jump into the gameplay. And ensure that behavioral patterns of interface interactions and general task flow are consistent throughout the experience. And if there's a change in a behavioral pattern, make it clear and make sure it's for a good reason. UX industry standard best practice is, all, is to always accompany a symbol with a label to ensure that it conveys the right message. Symbols without labels are good for puzzle games or for exploring new virtual worlds. However, this is not an effective form of communication for tutorials or for UI menus. When you're dealing with in-world UI elements, standard UX best practices, interaction patterns, and design principles still apply. And due to the current techno technological limitations of interactions, it can be difficult to pick up or manipulate small objects or perform tasks with precision. So you want to provide a larger target area for the smaller objects or explore methods of magnetism and stickiness or close link algorithms to enable easier interaction. And that should be used with care since it could be annoying if it's not implemented well. And due to potential limitations in physical real world environments, when the main play space is standing at a table, for instance, try to avoid making the play area for the required task larger than necessary. Use intention in your play space design to ensure the items are placed ergonomically and to reduce the risk of accidental interactions. And make sure that the interactions are polished so that the controls don't interfere with the game mechanics or the user experience and use interaction controls in context. For example, is the rate caster really needed while you're holding a card with a grip button? or interacting with a touch panel that's right in front of you. Support multiple controller types, especially for PC-based experiences, and ensure that your onboarding and tooltips match the controller being used. And pay attention to regional mental models for controllers when you're designing an experience for an international audience or planning to release an existing one to a new region. Um, a great example that I like to give is the Sony PlayStation controller. They use symbols for their buttons instead of English letters. And this is a brilliant design when you're considering an international audience with the varied writing systems. The problem you run into is when you get into the meanings of the symbols depending on the country. This is one of the main reasons that it's the standard UX best practice to always accompany symbols or icons with labels in your UI designs. In the United States, the circle button is generally used as the back button in the menu systems and the X for selection. However, in Japan, they're reversed. The X is the back button and the circles select. And since our muscle memory and our mental models get used to certain interaction patterns, when they suddenly change, it takes an extra level of cognitive load to make the change. And in the meantime, a lot of accidental and preventable interactions are happening. And this is another reason we need to do that upfront research on our target audience. Why am I talking about PlayStation controllers? How does this relate to XR controllers? You won't know until you do the research. So when establishing the initial information architecture, designed to scale up over time where possible while still ensuring that the structure is simple and clear at all stages. It's possible that multiple modules may be added as time goes by and more adventures and features are included. The information structure is vital to helping people find the content they need when they need it. And you can learn more about information architecture with these books from Rosenfeld Media, Card Sorting, Designing Usable Categories by Donna Spencer, and Content Everywhere, Strategy and Structure for Future Ready Content by Sarah Walker Butcher. And we as humans have finite brains and can't pay attention to everything going on all the time. So it stands to reason that we're going to make mistakes and miss things. And that's why it's our job as designers to try to anticipate the most common errors people can make and design our experiences in such a way as to prevent as many of those errors as possible. One of the most common errors is accidentally leaving the game without saving and losing hours of game progress. And at the very least, provide a message on exit asking them if they want to save their progress. If possible, it's best to provide this in addition to an autosave feature. And when you do provide the autosave feature, make it very clear that it's available and make sure there's an indicator when the game's autosaving so people know. And a lot of the high action games, such as Nier Automata, provide an option to target 
auto-target opponents. And this makes sense in high action situations. However, in turn-based tabletop RPGs, it's not necessary and it's actually usually not preferred. Again, know your target audience. Most players prefer to pick which opponent they're targeting, so don't make auto-targeting a default setting. It's okay to provide it as an option, but don't enable it by default. And here's what you need to especially think about when you're translating tabletop RPGs to a 3D immersive space. There's a standard translation of miniatures and maps into 3D spaces, but again, think about the play space, reach, and the head comfort zones. And also think about how the maps might obscure the minis, depending on how the maps are designed. Players love to roll their dice, and it's a big part of the tabletop RPG allure. So how would you roll the dice? Does the AI do it for you, or do you let the players do it? You could have a nice mix of letting the player roll the dice and move the minis, and then let the AI do all the math for the dice rolls. That's one option. And think about how the card decks and the character sheets or the stats translate into XR. And think about how the shops and the menus translate into XR. What should be diegetic during gameplay versus what should be in a UI panel that you bring up occasionally. And explore new ways to design the tabletop experience to reduce the risk of physical strain on your neck and shoulders. And if you're wanting to create an augmented or mixed reality experience, you would need to think about surfaces. Your maps and your play space would need to adjust to a variety of surface sizes. Also, depending on the headset, the controls and the interactions will be very different. So you need to know the headset that you're going to go with beforehand to design for the right interactions. And if you're going to be designing across multiple headsets, you need to take into account the best practices for each headset and support the interaction and controllers available for each. It's very important to make sure that the controller mapping and the other interaction elements are platform specific and that the UX best practices are followed for each in order to create the best possible experience. And this research is not for a real project that I'm working on. However, if this were an actual project, my next steps would be to start body storing body storming with 3D props and crafting supplies in physical space and then storyboard that out, storyboard out the flows. And then I would create a prototype in an app like Shapes XR to test play space design and flows with the target audience. And with that, I issue you a challenge. So the challenge is to create an XR tabletop RPG design concept in Shapes XR based on the research and the best practices that we've gone over today. The PDF of the resources and the details of the challenge should be shared out soon if it hasn't already been. And the requirements are to create two to three stages of a gameplay flow in Shapes XR, lock down the scenes so that people don't accidentally move things when you share it, and create a space code to share for review and record a video of you walking through your design decisions. Share the recording and the space code on LinkedIn with me at, at Ninja Robot Studio LLC. And the deadline is June 29th, 2022, and I'll review them live depending on how many I get. I will review them live on my Twitch stream on June 30th. And the reward will be that you will get social media exposure on my network and a great portfolio piece to use and a use case for your job hunt if you're trying to transition into the space. And I've created a list of links to reference the information that I've mentioned today. And that PDF is all together with the challenge that should be shared out soon again if it hasn't already been. And you can read all the best practices I've published so far on my website, the UX Rexar Toolkit. And here you can learn more about transitioning into XR from a UX designer's perspective. And you can learn the best practices for XR and dive deeper with video lessons. And you can see how others have solved XR design problems with the growing pattern library. More content is being added regularly. And be sure to follow me on all the things so that you can stay up to date on the content and the resources that I'm adding regularly. And that's all that I have for today. And I'll turn it back over to Brendan for Q&A. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, can everyone hear me and see me just one more time here? I can hear. Lovely. Okay. Okay. Got, gotcha. Everyone is uh, is pouring in now here. 
Okay, perfect. So, uh, so yeah, thank you very much, Aletha. Uh, great presentation. I definitely, uh, definitely think it's a very pragmatic approach to to kind of getting started and basically making sure that you have all the information that you need uh, to, you know, put into practice uh, before you know actually developing a game like that. Um, awesome. I'm gonna post one more poll in the uh, the polls tab, and that's just how likely are you to recommend this workshop to a friend or another, you know, interested party. Um, so I'll post that right now, and your feedback is again much appreciated. We just want to make sure that uh, again uh, we're on point with our our topics here for these workshops. Um, just one moment. So many. Okay, poll has been published. Apologies for the delay there. Um, perfect. So at uh, at Circuit Stream, we understand the value of experiential learning. Um, so I just want to take you through a, a few more kind of resources and ideas, uh, as well as uh, course you know course offerings here at Circuit Stream. Um, so to give you an idea of what this looks like in some uh, of our flagship courses, here are some of the projects our students work on and develop as they learn. Uh, so whether that's building you know scenes using Unity assets, uh, much like the ones displayed here, uh, or developing uh, AR projects in Vuforia and other similar, uh, similarly integrated tools. Uh, or if that's coding interactions and functionality in C-sharp, uh, our students have the opportunity to learn a broad set of skills while they create projects. Our alumni include a range of talented and curious learners who have gone on to launch their careers around XR. Lee Walker is a solutions architect with Kaleidoscope XR. Uh, Tenny Pinero, uh, who now works at Facebook or Meta Reality Labs. Andrew Alderidi, who became an XR developer working with some of the largest largest production studios in uh, in Hollywood to create virtual concert experiences. Uh, uh, Tara Oberoi, who is now a project manager at Unity. Uh, and then Jennifer Swan and Eileen Zhu, who were back-to-back -back Oculus Launchpad funding winners for the projects they began you know, while studying at CircuitStream. Uh, so many of these students started with little to no experience creating solutions or content for XR. Now, getting started doesn't have to be a huge commitment either. If you're looking to get started uh, in AR and completing your first full AR project, check out our six-part AR video course, which guides you through the processes and workflows of creating your first AR application. If you think C Sharp is uh, is intimidating, or perhaps an area you would like to focus on first uh, or strengthen, uh, check out our self-paced C Sharp scripting fundamentals course. Uh, again, um, smaller commitment. Uh, it's a four-week online course that will provide you with the core programming concepts of C Sharp uh, scripting that you can use when developing applications. We'll start at the very beginning and work our way up. Uh, by the end of the course, we will have built a small game. Now, for anyone wanting to really expand their horizons, CircuitStream has a number uh, of course offerings meant to equip students and professionals with the XR skills to pursue their own immersive projects or develop the necessary skills uh, to pursue a career in the XR industry. Our XR Development with Unity course is a live instructor-led curriculum with plenty of avenues for enduring support for both students and alumni. It is a project and portfolio-driven learning experience supplemented with opportunities to acquire an XR industry-specific certification directly through CircuitStream. Uh, the course is priced at $3,950, and our next cohorts will be launching on July 26th. Uh, this launch date also applies to any of our university partnerships, uh, which also includes the University of British Columbia Extended Learning, the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies, uh, the University of San Diego Professional and Continuing Education, as well as uh, the University of California Riverside. So again, all of these uh, all of these courses launch in a coordinated kind of effort um, around the same dates, and there are multiple time slots that you can choose from. Now, uh, each of our beginner-friendly XR courses is structured very similarly. So with our interaction design and prototyping course, you can expect the same project-driven live instructor-led format, complete with its own specific certification path for designers. Uh, the course is also priced at 3950 
And the next cohort will be launching on July 13th, uh, as is the case with the University of British Columbia Extended Learning, the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies, the University of San Diego Professional and Continuing Education, and the University of California Riverside. Uh, so again, our 10 week extra courses are very much beginner friendly. There's no previous design or development experience uh, required to get started. Beginners are you know, certainly welcome. Uh, and then one last quick note about our 10 week courses is we have the standalone option, but we're also currently offering a plus package, which includes uh, one of our XR dev or XR interaction design courses, but also our C sharp scripting fundamentals course and 10 hours of dedicated one on one time with an instructor, which we recommend using for project support or further mentorship on XR concepts. Finally, our 24 week Unity Developer Bootcamp will be launching again on October 11th and will prepare you for a 3D development career. Uh, it teaches you C sharp coding logic. You'll be building 10 plus projects, including one that is your very own idea. You'll have one on one career services um, to leverage, uh, and it's going to give you industry recognized certifications as well. Uh, there are also details uh, around any scholarships uh, for the October cohort, cohort that will be made available in the near future. So, so stay tuned. Um, in terms of all of our courses, we have tons of flexibility around you know, how you approach tuition. Uh, with the Unity Developer Bootcamp, the total cost of the course is $14,995. Uh, does require one upfront payment of 1000 to secure your seat. Uh, and then there are tons of uh, ways that you can look to finance this over time to help you know, manage the total tuition costs. These finance plans include for international students, uh, three, six, and 12 month um, payment plan options. Uh, you would just have to kind of inquire about those directly through one of our enrollment advisors. And then for any US students, we work with a company called Climb. They focus uh, almost exclusively on helping people fund educational programs. Um, so they have external loans available for up to five years via uh, via our partner and they have great terms available so it would require a, a small application doesn't take too long and uh you know there's no no credit or anything like that involved uh, but definitely if you're curious um, hit up one of our enrollment advisors they'd love to kind of talk, uh, talk to you more in depth about how this could work uh, last but certainly not least, I wanted to mention, you know, what is personally my favorite part about the education we provide here at CircuitStream, uh, and that's the CircuitStream community. So it's a great place to network, collaborate, or participate in events like game jams. It's also where the enduring support for students and alumni resides. We have open office hours five times a week with our instructors that are available to existing students and all of our alumni, even after graduation. Uh, so this is great for continued learning, troubleshooting in the future, uh, and any project support that you may need um, or insight that you may need in the future. Uh, and I want to give a massive shout out to Arky, our student experience coordinator, who is also mixing things up regularly in there with coffee hours, showcases, and events like Demo Day, where our students are invited to share their personal projects and stories. Now, also regarding our community, if you're interested in hearing about the experiences of our students directly from their mouths, uh, let us know. We'd love to put you in touch with some of our student ambassadors who can share their stories and learning experiences going through our courses. Uh, Diana and Monday are a few of our student ambassadors who will be happy to connect. Uh, Diana is currently an engineer, XR designer, and the founder of her very own company called M4 Method. Uh, and Monday works in business strategy and innovation for the healthcare sector and is passionate about XR development and C Sharp programming specifically. Uh, recently, he was also hired by uh, Bungie. So the studio made famous by the Halo franchise, uh, if anyone's familiar. Uh, so feel free to inquire about getting connected with one of our student ambassadors if you'd like to get a first-hand account of the learning experience that we provide here at CircuitStream. If you're looking to get a closer look at course information or our curriculums, you can download the, uh, the syllabus also from any of our courses on our website at circuitstream.com or any of our affiliated university websites listed here. 
Uh, now, if you have a specific question or want to learn more, you can also speak with any of our enrollment advisors. Um, so Leanne, Roham, Shoshana, Stella, Christina, Robin, they would all love to chat and learn a little bit more about what you're looking to learn about with, within the field of XR or Unity. Uh, just want to say one last thank you to, uh, to everyone who joined us today, uh, as well as Aletha. That was great information that you shared. And at this point, I'd like to kick off the Q&A uh, portion of the workshop. So if Aletha, if you're still around, love to have you back on stage here. Perfect. Perfect. So we have lots of great questions, uh, and uh, and I do appreciate everyone posting those in the questions tab. It's definitely going to help us uh, stay on track here. Um, so I'm just going to order these by upvote, uh, just as a way to get started. Um, so the first question we have, Aletha, would be from Scott. Uh, does CircuitStream have any scholarship grant opportunities? Uh, so that's one for me, probably. Uh, we do. We have uh, we have sales uh, on occasion that we launch. So that would be a good time to uh, to certainly inquire whenever those happen. Typically, we're putting them um, our tuition at ten to fifteen percent off. Uh, but we do have scholarships available as well for the Unity Developer Bootcamp. Um, we're currently kind of restructuring those. So again, that's kind of a tentative item. Stay tuned. There will be more news about this in the near future. Uh, but I appreciate the, the question, Scott. A uh, question from Tori. Uh, what kinds of things can be adjusted to help lower motion sickness when you are creating something for VR? That I have a bunch of articles on that, on motion sickness specifically, and videos that you can check out on that website to learn more. Um, it's a long answer <laughs> so um you can check out those videos in that article sounds like there's a, a couple of things you can do to uh to help that um that so the pdf that they're sharing out has that and then also i have a link tree um that i can type in the chat okay wonderful great question tori um so the next question would be from uh jay I can't start the live answer for some reason, but um, the question is, does this use any JavaScript? So I think that was for like a general question about the workshop itself. Um, no JavaScript needed. Uh, and then with regards to many of our courses, we are typically sticking, sticking to C-sharp scripting like almost exclusively, um, unless you're you know wanting to approach the uh, the one-on-one -on -one sessions that we have for live mentorship and project support, those are a little more open-ended and flexible. If you want to learn more about C++, we do have instructors who are well-versed and, and can kind of, uh, you know, carry you through that topic a little bit further. But uh, no JavaScript. Um, we're typically not relying on JavaScript here at CircuitStream. Um, next question is from Samia. Which course has a massive programming part for VR? So. This one's for me again. Um, the XR development with Unity course would be the more like programming oriented track um, of courses here at CircuitStream, as well as the Unity Developer Bootcamp. Uh, both of those, you'll be learning a ton about C Sharp, um, its syntax, structure, the important you know information that you need to know to actually create um, a full fledged application. Um, so, great question, Simia. Yeah. Uh, another question. Oh. Another question from Scope. Oh, they're jumping around on me here a little bit. Uh, question from Avanish. Uh, is there a specific headset you'd recommend we use or any at all? You're talking about me personally? I have many. You can see the PlayStation VR headset in the background there. It's actually my favorite headset just because it's really lightweight, but you're not going to have as many options for experiences on it because it's only PlayStation. But, um, I have a original Quest and I have a Vive Cosmos. So if you are going to look into getting one, um, Vive Cosmos has the most trouble, like I said, I mentioned earlier, because the game makers aren't mapping the controllers to the Cosmos. So they all think that the Cosmos controller is the Vive wand, which makes it difficult um, for me to interact with a lot of games because they're not mapped correctly. So if you're looking at the Cosmos, that may be something you want to think about. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, if you have the funds, there is a new one coming out whenever Meta releases their new one that's coming out project. Is that Cambria? 
not sure when that's coming out yet, but quest two is good as well. The quest is going to give you a uh, standalone. So, and there are tons of options available for the quest. Valve index controllers are awesome. And if you get a PC based headset, um, you can uh, use the valve index controllers with any of those. They should, most of the PC based headsets, you can use the index knuckles. Yeah. If you have the funds, those are expensive. If you, if you have the funds. Yeah. I was, I was, uh, that made me a little curious. So is the reason that you can use the, um, controllers, uh, from the index with other PC based headsets, is that because it's all done through steam VR? I think so. I'm, I think so. And valve is steam. So probably. Okay. Okay. Right on. Awesome. But um, you'll add, I, I would say double check. But double, you, double you check can that. use Valve Index controllers with the Vive Cosmos. I mean, with the uh, Vive, um, not the Cosmos, the uh, Pro. I haven't tried it with the Cosmos. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Um, another question from Scott. Uh, is it possible that by sticking with UX norms, like select cancel button uh, conventions, we are stagnating innovation and dampening the potential to improve on existing standards? If so, with a medium like XR, which is in relative infancy, should we encourage experimentation to find the best norms? You can always experiment. And I would say I always try to think out of the box. I always ask why uh, something is a convention, because there may be a very good reason that it is a convention. So you would, and you absolutely have to study anything that you're doing with humans uh, and not just the people on your programming team. You have to go out and actually research with your target audience these new things to make sure that they're not going to cause more trouble. Um, but innovation is always uh, is always good. Just make sure you back it up with research. Innovation always welcome. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> awesome question, Scott. Uh, very very good question, though. Another one from Scott. Um, is there any literature you'd recommend on VR and AR? I have a ton of links in that PDF that I shared, I think. Um, but they are all on the, um, on the website as well. Um, and books, as far as books, I did mention the gamer's brain earlier. That is just for gaming, but there is the VR, uh, book by Dr. Jason Gerald. And then remind me of his name. He wrote a book, UX for XR. Cornell, it's that one, <laughs> Hillman, <laughs> that one, <laughs> check that one out. UX for XR by Corman Hillman, Cornell Hillman. Beautiful. Somebody uh, in the chat mentioned that? US? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah, I'm looking at awesome. the chat. Sorry. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> uh, okay, perfect. Uh, another question from Jay. Oh, wait, I already answered that. Uh, question from Hiana. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Do you have a course on using Shapes XR? The interaction design and prototyping course does cover Shapes XR. Yeah. That we have. Yeah. Simply put, perfect. Yeah. So uh, the interaction design will cover a number of, you know, it's not just Unity. It's going to cover a number of def different integrated uh, AR, VR related applications that you can use for creation and, and design. Uh, so it's not just, you know, sticking directly to Unity. You will learn about some of the other important kind of tools uh, as well as techniques uh, during that course. Um, and if and you, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, and Shapes XR also does workshops regularly, I believe, free ones. Um, and if you want to go more in depth, um, we have a course that covers this. That is one of the tools it covers. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, if uh, if you're wanting to look a little bit deeper into that, definitely I would encourage you, uh, Hannah, to uh, reach out to one of our enrollment advisors. Definitely download the course syllabus from our website, and it should give you a, a good kind of overview of uh, of some of the uh, material that you will learn about. Question from Adrian: How do you design haptics for VR? Uh, best practices for that? Any insight here? I haven't personally written any best practices on that. Um, you do want to use haptics as a form of feedback. Um, it is a good practice to always try to use haptics, but don't use them to the point that they're annoying uh, because they can become annoying. Um, 
if, for example, you're trying to get someone's attention to look down at your hand, the controller that um, you're holding in your hand, if it is a consistent, constant vibration that does not stop and it's just bzzz, that is very annoying. Don't do it. Um, you just do like little short bursts um, of vibration. And um, I, I, a good one to study, a good, a very good experience to study would be on the Quest, the um, Oculus First Steps. Uh, you can study how they do onboarding, which is excellent. And you can study um, haptics, feedback, physics, different types of interactions and how they walk you step by step through something. Um, so deconstruct how I study and is to deconstruct existing things that I think work and just go in and study how are they doing this? What would be better and study that with humans? Because that's also what I've done. I've done usability testing with humans to see how are they responding to these things. And that's how I come up with all the content and all the best practices that I've written. Always include humans in your study. <laughs> You need the humans. You gotta. Yes. You gotta they're the ones the using it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, of course, your target audience is um, animals, then you need to study that, those. That's very. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Great question. Uh, next question is from uh, Vizaras. So I had posted this one uh, just from the the chat there. But uh, are there info arc best practices for XR? Is there an established tool or language used to visualize XR info? Uh, Info arc, i.e., would the XR design system analyst use UML diagrams? I am out on this one. Um, if you have context, that would be lovely. So, the um, information architecture best practices are basically the same as you would have for any other kind of application. It's just going to be a little bit different for VR uh, because changing the information architecture is a lot more difficult in a VR experience to go back and change things because you're not just looking at words on a page um, or flows. You're also thinking about what's in the environment. Um, so you're translating this into a 3D space. So you're it's not just 2D screens anymore. Um, so when you're thinking, you're also thinking about information coming through sound, information coming through um, animations, visuals, NPC behaviors, what all kinds of different models are portraying what information. And so you have to think about that. So you can use diagrams to mark that out. I actually start in um, all of mine either using post-its in Miro or mind mapping tool or um, because I don't, I'm not an information architecture architect, but I do look at it for when I'm designing. And I'll like do basic ones and um, yeah. And then sometimes I actually, when I do study a VR scene and it's gonna be very hard to describe because you would have to see it, but I actually draw a map of the virtual space. I'll draw a map of it like, um, like a architecture map of it or an interior design map of it. Where are these items in that space? what information is being portrayed at any particular point in that, that that's how I think. So that's how I do it. Uh, um, I, I don't know if there are any like people that have written on VR XR specifically for information architecture, but that's how I'm figuring it out myself. Um, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe like I'm looking at the chat, <laughs> maybe like a uh, layout and animation, maybe. Um, I'm visualizing it and if I'm like analyzing something that's already out there to assess it for usability or say or from an expert UX review, I'll also sometimes draw it out on a map and because that actually helps me see where there are inconsistencies in behaviors and content that can um, tell me where some confusion is happening. If that made sense. But it's hard for me to get out of my brain and explain that. <laughs> oh, okay, so showing you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From the sounds of things, it uh, it sounds like there's no kind of like standard, um, you know, way of doing it. So it's there. It's something... There might be somebody that's written about it, uh, but I haven't seen it yet. I see. Okay. 
Well, very, very thought provoking uh, question, Vizarath. So uh, much appreciated. Uh, next question is from uh, Jay. So what will be the price of the programs? Also, is there a ISA option? So I'm not entirely sure what an ISA option is. Um, but yeah, as, uh, as mentioned, the uh, XR development with Unity courses start at 3,950. Uh, there is a bundle with the C-sharp scripting course, as well as 10 one-on-one -on -one sessions that you would take in tandem with the XR course. Um, that would be 4,950, so an extra thousand. And then we do have different kind of payment options available. Uh, our C-sharp scripting fundamentals course is 349 uh, if you're wanting to take that standalone. And then if you're just wanting to kind of dip your toes in and start getting experience with AR, uh, go ahead and check out the uh, the AR self-directed course we have as well. Six-part uh, video series that's going to you know have you building potentially your first AR project. Um, so that starts at 50. Uh, another question from Scott. What project is Aletha most proud of uh, that she's worked on? Oh, very curious about this one myself. I can't talk details because I'm under NDA, but it <laughs> has saved lives. Oh, wow. So. Are there are there any um, runner-ups that you can share? Uh, all of the stuff that I've written and published, I mean, <laughs> that's like the hugest thing i was actually writing down a list of like articles that i've written it's like wow i've written a ton <laughs> I've created a ton of content um that i never really stopped to think about so i guess all the content that i've put out there so far is what i'm most proud of that i can share um except, except for the stuff that has actually saved lives that i can't talk about fair enough that's super that's super intriguing and super mysterious so uh, <laughs> um it training. sounds very. It Safety sounds training. very cool. Yeah. Maybe someday you can uh, you can share a little bit more on the subject matter. Yeah. But uh, we we definitely appreciate you saving lives, Alifa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, great question, Scott. Uh, next question is from Samia. Would you suggest to buy uh, now an Oculus Quest Two or waiting for the Pro One? Me the personally, Quest. I'm. So I already have an original Quest, so I didn't want to buy the Quest 2 because it wasn't enough of a jump to warrant me buying it a year after I already got the original. So I'm waiting for the Pro. Um, but there are multiple headsets that I'm wanting to buy, so it's like I have to decide, do I want that? Do I want the Tilt uh, 5? <laughs> do I want Apple and Google are supposedly coming out with some? It's like... Um, hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's 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 a difficult question. It depends on how long you want to wait to get a headset. Yeah, I went to the uh, the Augmented World Expo recently, and uh, and there's tons of um, innovations in hardware that are kind of in the pipe. Um, so I have a Quest Two, and I I'm going to be waiting for you know maybe one of the the largest the larger manufacturers producers to to come out with their technology. So. Um, I'm going to be on my quest too, probably for another couple of years at the very least. But uh, if you're wanting to make sure you have like the you know best technology, newest technology, but it's also your starter, uh, maybe want to wait for wait for the pro by the sounds of things. Yeah, I have I I have the original quest that I pre-ordered, so I've had it since. When did it come out? May June 2019. Still works. So. Um, if they've used the same manufacturing quality for the Quest 2, hopefully it'll be around a while. But yeah, it's up to you. Decide when when you want to buy it. And um, if you want the latest and greatest, I would say wait. But yeah. Yeah, great input. OK. Uh, great question, Samia. So uh, next question is from Kevin. How do you conduct research surveys in-house? So I haven't done any um, human research lately, but I have done remote usability testing. And I have done, so it depends on the type of thing you're doing. So if you're doing, uh, if you're just studying the target audience to generate insights and learn, surveys don't help, especially not for VR. You're, I do use them, but they're supplements. I go observe them in their habitat in their work environment or whatever environment that it is that I'm going to be designing an experience based on. Most of my experience is doing training, 
like I said, I mentioned safety training. So I would go to where they work and I would watch them work and talk to them, uh, ask them questions and map out how they work and their flows and so forth. And for that type of research, it's not going to do enough to just interview and it's not going to be enough to just survey. So you have to have a combination of research. And then um, for usability testing, uh, to test like validated design um, that can be done remotely or in person. Um, and I've actually written about that on uh, as well <laughs> on the website. <laughs> you guys are asking. And you can also learn about it in the interaction de uh, design and prototyping class if you take that. Yeah, you guys are asking all the amazing questions that Aletha has like already produced content for. So de definitely uh, encourage you to go check out anything that she's produced in the past because um, she does you know she does have a wealth of knowledge on the subject matter uh, and as you as you mentioned Aletha you know you've created tons of bodies of work around you know best practices and uh, and how to approach some of these concepts um, so definitely go check out more from Aletha uh, next question is going to be from uh, Samia again would you suggest you buy nope I just answered that one my apologies uh rejoice um i already did some armr projects need to expand my knowledge which course should i choose which part of your knowledge are you wanting to expand because the development side and the design side are very different parts of your brain so um if you could clarify that that would be good but if yeah. you're wanting to um oh there you go dayan put something in <laughs> There you go. In the chat. Yeah. Are I mean, these are, are these links? Is there? I'm, I might be asking too much of people, but in the show notes for the on demand later, will they be available? These uh, links they, that are I don't think the chat is available for the recordings, unfortunately. Um, but again, anyone who uh, anyone who is watching, definitely, I would encourage you if you're if you're wanting to kind of find what potentially would be the good track for you or the right uh, the right material for you to be learning more about uh, just just reach out you know inquire uh, ask any of our enrollment advisors uh, about just that what what's kind of the best um, kind of approach this is my background this is my experience I want to learn more about XYZ uh, and they'll be able to kind of you know share with you um, what what would be a good fit uh, so definitely I would just the message there I, I think would be just encouraging you to reach out and and just inquire, uh, just be curious. Um, and, you know, we have a great team here that will help you kind of get on the right track. Uh, so another question from Jay, after this program, should we expect to be able to build our own XR tabletop game? Uh, also, is there capstone projects like building our own tabletop RPG? Uh, so I'm not sure if he's talking about the workshop today or the, the actual uh, interaction design course, but uh, maybe you could speak a little bit more about the um, course. So for this workshop, it was basic overview. Um, there, If you already have uh, experience with design, it's going to be easier for you just from this workshop. The course, is that okay? Yeah. Um, so you will have a lot more base. The Interaction and Design and Prototyping course, you'll have a lot more base knowledge available to you because we go over the best practices, go over the different types of technology. We give you um, a foundational UX best practices, and then we go through different types of tools. So you'll have a lot more knowledge. Um, and there are multiple projects that you do throughout the course uh, too. Um, it's not, none of them are tabletop RPG, but you could take what you learn and make one or work on one as a side project yeah so depending depending on if um you're going through the course with the bundle package with the one-on-one -on -one time because you know we've had students um use that one-on-one -on -one time to just fully build their own projects uh, with the support and mentorship of an instructor and kind of you know someone there to help give them guidance lay out a roadmap for them um, but yeah you'll have all of the kind of tools and uh and experience and knowledge to build your own project after the interaction design course, uh, but it's not explicitly about you know building an RPG tabletop uh, experience. Uh, but yeah, that one-on-one -on -one time, if you know if that's something that you would want to look into, um, very open-ended and flexible time that you can use for whatever you know XR Uni related pursuits that you have. 
Um, so great question. Um, next question again is from Scott. Scott is a curious kitten today. He's got lots of great questions for us. So uh, what's your favorite VR game experience from a UX standpoint? Uh, also, have you tried out Mask Maker? I found the UX for that one uh, simultaneously fresh and incredibly intuitive. So I'm writing down Mask Maker. So I can look it up. I have not tried it. Um, so it's on my list. But from a UX standpoint, I actually love the F Oculus First Steps. <laughs> I talk about it a lot in First Contact, um, Oculus First Contact. Those were designed very, very well, and you could actually study those a lot to learn from them. And also Moss. I haven't tried Moss 2. There's a new one. I think it's out. Um, but the original Moss, I also really like studying that game. There are some problems with it, but um, I love those games. Those are my favorite. You could deconstruct those. The Moss 2, I think it's out. I uh, yeah, I've, I've only I haven't tried it yet, but Moss looked looked like a very different kind of like gaming experience. That's it's, the one thing I noticed from the previous. It's awesome. Yeah, worth it. Mm -hmm. All right, we have to give it a shot then. There's a there's Moss and Moss Two, so they have a sequel. So, would you recommend just starting yeah, with the first I, one so I you can understand? Say, I don't know because I haven't tried Moss Two to see if it's something you could do standalone. But right, um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, fair enough. Um, <laughs> another great question from Scott. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next question is from Muhammad. I keep uh, hearing talk about Oculus Quest Two, but what about Oculus Rift S? They're stopping support for the Rift S. It's a very good headset, but they're stopping support for it. So, um, yeah, it's how long do you want to? How do you want to risk buying a Rift if you don't know when they're going to stop providing new content for it? Now that you can still use the Rift S on Steam, I believe, right? You can use Rift S on Steam. Um, yeah, because you can use the Quest on Steam with the link cable. So, yeah. Um, so, you'd essentially, it sounds like you'd be relying on, like, non-native. Non right. Uh, you wouldn't platforms. have the Oculus meta support for right. it if you did buy it. Okay. Okay, well, hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps, Mohammed. Um, next question is from Scott again. Uh, okay, this uh, this is a bit personal, but I'm interested in getting into VR development for the purpose purposes of child trauma therapy. I recently finished my bachelor's in comp sci, and I'm trying to figure out how to angle my way into the industry. Any tips? So. Um, a good, so what I did, um, was I just, so networking, of course, but I, and you can con connect with me on LinkedIn to get in the network because there's a ton of us in the network, but I would suggest, um, starting to, as you are getting more and more into VR development, be more vocal about your mission and your passion and start creating papers, uh, blog articles, videos of you prototyping, doing research, and just putting content out there about that to educate people and say what you're working on. And that'll start getting you seen amongst people. Um, that's how I did it. I just started publishing all the stuff I've researched and networked with uh, LinkedIn and stuff. Yeah, fair enough. And and if you have um, if you have your concept kind of you know neatly and nicely packaged at this point, um, that's something that you can start kind of sharing. Uh, I think with you know other members of this community uh, and anyone who may be you know interested in that field uh, from like a business or or even you know, entrepreneurial standpoint. Um, thanks again, Scott. Uh, next question is from Samia. Which laptops would you suggest to have for good VR development? So don't we have resources on that? We do. So, uh, so yeah, this is a very, again, like open-ended question. Um, there's any, you know, any different, I guess, tons of different avenues you could go. Um, obviously, there's there's going to be minimum requirements, but if you really want a uh, a strong machine, it's, you know, it's going to be more, more expensive. 
but do we have uh, Dehan? Do we have Z the, uh... just put one in the chat? Oh, Z. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, will it run uh, VR requirements for development and design? Check out that post because because uh, that's gonna you know kind of give you some guidelines at the very least. Awesome. And thank VGA you for the connectors. Does anything still use VGA connector? I haven't seen them for a while. <laughs> I, I seen I saw them where I used to work two years ago. <laughs> uh, next question is from uh, is from Lena. Uh, hi, Lena. I recognize that name. Uh, do you provide portfolio reviews for designers who are interested in UX for XR? Not many have actually come to me and asked for it. <laughs> uh, Take some initiative. Yeah, is that is that something that um, that you or or some of our instructors you know have like time on the books to do? On the books, I mean, if you're in the um, circuit stream community, I'm, I'm assuming that's something that you do in the circuit stream community. But if you're asking me personally, um, I mean, I, there's only so much time I can spend on it because, um, you know, time. But um, so I believe I believe Lena is in the uh, the community already. Definitely would be a good oh, opportunity okay. to go uh, to go and ask at one of the open office hours. So next time they're announced, um, just see if you can go check out and, and see if uh, uh, how much time you'd kind of need to allocate towards that, and, and whether or not our instructors can um, can do that. Uh, I don't see it as being a, a problem, um, but just yeah, definitely check with the community and, and check with our instructors more directly. And thank you for the question. Uh, how much time do you have uh, here, Aletha? Do you have anything um, like scheduled for upcoming I on can, your end? I can keep going. Do we have another couple uh, couple minutes here? We have a lot, a lot of great questions. So um, next one will be from Fiona. Uh, animals, yes. Uh, but the yeah. cow thing on social media recently misunderstood the nature of cows. Do you know anyone who has been developing alternative headsets that other species can wear? Perhaps any tech experiences VR for another species? Yeah, I saw that thing on social media about um, calming the cows so they produce more milk. Um, I didn't look into it um, to see how well that went. Is that what you're saying, that it misunderstood it? Um, I don't know of any other ones. I didn't, I do know that they've been studying brain interfaces with monkeys, um, but I'm not sure. So yeah, in anything. interesting question, Fiona. I don't know if we have the context uh, to really speak on the subject at this point, um, but uh, but that would be an interesting one to ask again in like our community because uh, I'm sure they there's tons of people who who would take an interest and, and maybe have you know a little bit more context than we do. Um, so yeah, sorry, we don't have a, a more definitive answer for you, uh, but great question nonetheless. Uh, next question is from uh, Gavin. I have a quest too. It's great. Uh, it's great bit of kit. I do wonder what the difference will be for the pro. Is there any info on that? Um, eye tracking, face tracking, I think that you'd have to check out their website because they only release so much info at a time. So you would just have to go check out their website about it, Meta. Yeah, fair enough. They may be holding their cards close too. So, uh, so you know, hopefully there's more of a development on that. Uh, last question, I promise, Scott. I'm going to see if he has any other ones. Nope, this may actually be <laughs> indeed Scott's last question uh, until the next one. Um, <laughs> what is something that you, you're excited about related to the XR industry that you didn't get an opportunity to touch on yet in this presentation? Um, thinking about the future of everyday life in XR, um, how do we translate our everyday apps into XR is as it becomes more and more ubiquitous. I haven't. I'm starting to put thought into it, but I haven't uh, done a lot with it yet. Yeah, again, at the at the expo, um, I didn't actually get to see or, or try anything on or anything like that. But uh, but there was, you know, whisperings about a basically an AR um, contact lens that that's kind of where the future is going. Maybe, maybe not in the next yeah. you know, five, 10 years, but um, essentially having this kind of technology around in place of like your smartphone where it's something wearable, something you have access to without even having to really 
pick it up or uh, yeah. or turn turn on your phone. Or well, anything. it would need to be contacts and eyeglasses because not everyone can wear contacts. But just I AR that looks like this, basically just your normal eyeglasses and and contacts. Um, that's where they're trying to get. Um, w once you can use both, once it is your prescription glasses and AR combined, then I will be more willing to accept it. But if you have to have both, then that's too cost prohibitive. Um, it has to be both. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, and that's... then hopefully you don't have to charge your glasses to be able to see. They have to figure that out. Yeah. Little solar panels on the side or like a solar panel. I, I don't know. Don't. Well, uh... I can't use contacts either. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, great question, Scott. No, I was just joking around, but uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed all the questions you've asked, so I, I do appreciate it. Um, next question is from Fiona. We've been working with an older demographic to do some rehabilitation systems using VR. Any useful links for that? Um, I know that I have been looking at how there's a certain Christiana Medical Network. Christiana is the name of the medical um, system, the hospitals and that are doing chemo. They're using VR during chemotherapy. Um, I don't have any other uh, resources, so I'm sure they're out there. I'm sure they're working on it. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Oh, Dayan put a post link to virtual reality, virtual reality therapy um, article that Circuit Stream has done. Beautiful. Dayan is all over this. Uh, thank you, Dayan, for moderating the chat. Um, yeah, and yeah, great, great question, Fiona. So, next question is from Daniel Is the Unity AR VR course uh, largely using Vuforia, or is there another tool used uh, that I am unaware of? The Unity AR VR course. So that would be XR development with Unity that you're that you're speaking about. Um, either way, Vuforia is is touched on. It's not. It's by no means the you know star of the show. Um, so you're again you're going to learn about a number of different integrated tools um, integrated with Unity, and uh, we wanted to cast kind of you know a, at least a wide enough blanket around the, the course material that you'll be able to not just be familiar with unity but a lot of the other kind of supplemental tools and practices uh, that go with it so it's it's not um you know it's not all entirely about one you know application or engine uh, but a, a number of different tools that will uh, supplement your your learning and experience overall uh last Last two questions, I believe. Just double check. Uh, so from Talu Wanimi, uh, continued question. Oh, okay, it's continued question actually. So I'll ask the other one first. Are the circuit stream courses applicable to someone new to development and software? I have extensive design and art background, but minimal software limited to website design. Um, so I think I answered this one in the chat, but. You don't have to have any prior experience um, to join either of our beginner-friendly XR courses. And it, it, again, it sounds like you have some uh, some great supplemental skills uh, that would only help throughout the, the learning process. Uh, but no no prior experience is required. Uh, what I was mentioning about the Unity Developer Bootcamp is there is you know a slight, um, there's basically a, an entrance test that you would need to take. They're, they're not quite beginner-friendly. Um, in terms of what you're learning. So slightly more intermediate level uh, is for the Unity Developer Bootcamp, if that's what you're looking into. Uh, but great question, nonetheless. Uh, and then the continued question, because of character limit, I have a physical card tabletop games that I have designed that I want to be converted to digital. Was that continued from the question of, will you be able to do a tabletop RPG after completing the course? Was that a continuation of that? question uh, i think that was actually asked by somebody else yeah that was asked by jay um so i think that was kind of just a separate question but maybe written at the same time physical tabletop uh, game that i have designed yeah that what was the question digital so he has a uh i think a game that he's 
he's created as a physical version and would like to bring yeah. that into, you know, an, an AR or VR experience. So is that, uh, is yeah. that something he'd be able to do, you know, after our course? Um, you would have a lot more of your foundational knowledge there to equip you to do that. Yeah. Um, there is, it's only a 10 week course, but it will give you a lot of the foundational stuff that you need. Um, always validate and test with humans though. Um, you should be able to work on it though. You should be able to prototype and get into that. Is, is that, if that's the question. Yeah, I hope we're getting that question right. But yeah, okay. if um, if you have an idea or a concept that you'd like to create, uh, we've also had students take both of our courses because they want to they want to be able to kind of create the prototype and then go on to create the full, you know, full build of it. Um, so that is going to require both design elements and development elements. So if if you're wanting to create this kind of very wide skill set for yourself, um, we've had students do both programs, and again, they're very um, supplemental of one another. If you're looking at more of, um, you know, joining an organization as like a UI, UX designer or product uh, designer, um, interaction design might make more sense. If you're wanting to be um, in the development role, XR development is, is going to you know make more sense there. Uh, again, if you have this idea that you want to follow through on, um, both skills are going to be necessary. So if, you know, if you're not wanting to to learn more about both aspects, then you, you may need to form a bit of a team in, in doing so. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, and that's one of the things about the network in Circuit Stream is that you can, you're in that community and you can team up with others to work on uh, something. Because I absolutely promise you that it's a lot of work, and you're going to want help. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work to make a game. <laughs> yeah, very much so, very much so. But uh, but great question, uh, Talu and Nimi, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly as well. Um, and then we just have one more question. I think this is the last question from Jay. Uh, VR for prisoners sounds like it might um, be a step towards the future, in my opinion. Is that a thing yet? I haven't heard of it. It's, an, it's a very interesting concept. I haven't, I haven't heard anything on the matter yet either. Um, I think that would, that would be a, an expensive program to start up, but you know, it's definitely an, an interesting thought. So uh, I don't so, know, putting them in empathy video, in empathy experiences and things to help rehabilitate them, educate them on humanity, maybe. Um, I haven't heard of it though. Oh, well, there you go. There's an article. Okay. New VR system has prisoners practicing. I, it cuts off. So something. Practicing. Life beyond bars. Okay, so it's Life yeah, it would bars. be almost like a oh yeah, because yeah. yeah, depend and also depending on how long you've been in prison, um, world changes pretty quick. So it's hard to adjust. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a very that's a very interesting idea, that's Jay. Cool. And uh, if you know if you don't see anything that is making strides in that area, you know that could be your your first kind of motion towards this uh, this space in general. So um, I would urge you to to kind of pursue that curiosity. Um, yeah. Awesome. They need, but, they need help. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a very good cause. So um, any last minute questions? Uh, I think we have all of them. And yeah, so that is a, uh, that is all for the Q and a and the workshop today. Aletha, thanks for sticking with us for so long. That was uh, a lot of curious, uh, a lot of curious folks in the, uh, the audience today and we do, again, appreciate you you all being here. Uh, so one final thank you. Thank you again, Aletha. Uh, any any last uh, comments? Um, well, thanks for having me. Um, always enjoy it. And uh, thanks, everyone, for all your questions and for hanging out. Perfect. All righty. Uh, with that, we will say goodbye. Have yourselves a, a lovely rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, and until next time, um, Take care. Thanks.